As we bring this unit to a close, I want to return to an idea that I first introduced when we began talking about the origin of our genus, the genus Homo. Now, when we talked about that, we talked about what sort of elements define the human niche. What attributes could be used to help understand and identify the genus Homo? And when we talked about that, we introduced several ideas. One is that the genus Homo began to produce stone tools. They began to use their large brain to produce stone tools, this external material that allowed them to process the environment in a different way, that allowed them to extract a different kind of resource out of the environment. This, in turn, allowed them to move into new environments. So with the origin of the genus Homo, we began seeing them move outside of Africa for the first time. Early Homo also sees an increase in the social capacity of humans. We began probably seeing the first evidence of uh, extended social care. Recall that Dionysian individual who lacked any teeth as perhaps a tantalizing hint of the kind of evidence of associated with social care and social importance, but clearly moving towards a niche that involved more social involvement, more social dependence and interdependence. If we return now to the end of the Pleistocene, and we look at the human niche at the end of the Pleistocene, we see it's largely unchanged. We see that many of those same factors are still at play. At the end of the Pleistocene, we now see humans moving into new and different environments. Now obviously they've moved into many more environments than they did at the beginning of the Pleistocene, but the same basic process holds true. They're still producing stone tools and still producing new stone tools, new advances in material culture, reflecting perhaps improved cognitive abilities, but still using those stone tools fundamentally to allow differential extraction of resources out of the environment, to allow them to identify both socially and ecologically in the world around them in a different way. We still see brain size increasing all the way up until the end of the Pleistocene, reflecting again this evolutionary importance of the cognitive apparatus that we have we still see evidence of increased social care, increased dependency and interdependency. We see now specialization in terms of the kind of materials individuals are producing in the archeological record. We see perhaps evidence of increased longevity reflecting increased social adaptation. So in other words, that niche that we introduced with the genus Homo is still the niche at play at the end of the Pleistocene. It's still the same process. Our brain size has increased threefold, and we're now producing new kinds of stone tools, not just functional elements, but elements that identify us as specific populations, that reflect symbolic value of meaning and understanding that exists between populations. So we've expanded our niche even broader, but fundamentally it's the same niche. Pleistocene humans are defined by several attributes. They are using external technology developed through increased cognitive capacity and perhaps increased social interdependence to move into different environments, to extract more and more resources out of the environment, to survive in a better way across environments and even within environments, so to live longer, to live better, to get more out of the environment. These are what defined us as Pleistocene humans. This is essentially the fundamental evolutionary niche that we occupy as humans, or at least that we occupied in our evolutionary past. Next week, we'll talk about how that niche changes, perhaps, in the last 20,000 years. That evolutionary place that we're at at the end of the Pleistocene, it turns out, sets up a whole new set of interactions and changes which occur in the last 20,000 years. Changes associated with the development of sedentary lifestyles, the development of agriculture, the production of even greater amount of food, and indeed the population explosion that we see on the planet today. But that's, in some ways, the story of the very, very recent past. For the most part, the story of becoming human is a story of the Pleistocene. It's a story of this niche that we've talked about, this unique social niche that humans occupy, one allowed for by a tremendous capacity to develop material culture that allows us to interact with the environment in unique ways, that allow us to extract resources out of the environment in increasingly novel ways, in new kinds of environments, facing new kinds of ecological problems. So this Conceptualizing human evolution in the context of thinking about the human niche is, I think, a very productive way to understand human evolution in the Pleistocene. It gives us a unique perspective to go back and look at these complex materials that we've talked about, the human fossil record, the human archeological record, even the human genetic record, and to understand it in a different lens, to think about the ways in which we're still connected to our past and the ways in which those processes are still at play in human populations today.